Hi, this is Shannon from No Shelf Control. Thank you for joining me on the channel this evening. I am here with a list of books that are being released on April the 25th that I am super excited about. There are 17 of those books, so it's a rather long list, but trust me, it is well worth it. I hope that you will stick around through the entire list because you really just cannot go wrong with this week's list of books. So why don't we go ahead and get started? April 25th, the first book on my list is The Morewood Family Rules, and that's by Helen K. Diamond. And on the cover of the book, it says, the family that steals together stays together. So I don't know if this is gonna be funny or serious, but let's take a look. Um, so it is published by Avon, and it is 384 pages, and of course, it's coming out on April the 25th. The synopsis says this, Knives Out and Ocean's Eight meets The Nest in this hilariously twisty novel by award-winning author Helen K. Diamond about a woman who returns home from prison to her dysfunctional con artist family and tries to get them to go legit. One day a con man met an heiress, wooed her, married her, had two kids, and kept on conning. Jillian Morewood is the oldest child from that meet-cute-gone-wrong marriage the stable one, the sensible and dependable one, the one who protects and fixes, the one who went to prison to save their sorry butts. Now, 39 months later, she's out and she's more than a little pissed. Finally home, she finds the scheming clan in full family fleecing mode. They all claim they didn't really agree to Jillian's previous go legit or else ultimatum before she went away. They viewed it as a suggestion and then ignored it. So business as usual. But Jillian is done with the lies and fakery. She demands the whole messed up crew clean up its act. And this time she's not kidding. She has the leverage to make it happen. Problem is her life is in shambles, but with the help of a great aunt, crooked but lovable, a bodyguard who was a nice surprise after three years in prison, and a few allies all working undercover, Jillian starts to put her life back together. She kicks out a few mooching relatives living under her roof, sets limits on everyone's access to the money, ducks from their various attacks, and sees if that bodyguard is maybe interested in sticking around for a while. For the first time, she's Jillian Morewood, her own woman, and she's ready to figure out who she is. So I loved all the Oceans 11, Oceans 8, Oceans 9, um, enjoyed Knives Out, and loved The Nest. So really hopeful about this book. Um, love seeing the family dynamics, and the fact that they're all con artists has got to put, you know, a little spice into the story. So I expect it to be um, driving plot and also pretty funny. So looking forward to that. The next one on my list is by a rather famous author. Um, it is called Small Mercies, and it is by Dennis Lehane. So I'm sure that you are familiar with him. You've got sort of a um, child at a riot kind of feel in the picture here. So we will see what that has to do with the story. Um, coming out April 25th, of course, it's by Harper, and it's 320 pages. So here's what we know about Small Mercies by Dennis Lehane. Small Mercies is thought-provoking, engaging, enraging, and can't put it down entertainment. And that quote is from Stephen King. The acclaimed New York Times bestselling writer returns with a masterpiece to rival Mystic River, an all-consuming tale of revenge, family love, festering hate, and insidious power set against one of the most tumultuous episodes in Boston's history. In the summer of 1974, a heat wave blankets Boston, and Mary Pat Fennessy is trying to stay one step ahead of the bill collectors. Mary Pat has lived her entire life in the housing projects of Southie, the Irish-American enclave that stubbornly adheres to old tradition and stands proudly apart. One night, Mary Pat's teenage daughter, Jules, stays out late and doesn't come home. That same evening, a young black man is found dead, struck by a subway train under mysterious circumstances. The two events seem unconnected, but Mary Pat, propelled by a desperate search for her missing daughter, begins turning over stones best left untouched, asking questions that bother Marty Butler, chieftain of the Irish mob, and the men who work for him, men who don't take kindly to any threat to their business. Set against the hot, tumultuous months when the city's desegregation of its public schools exploded in violence, 
Small Mercies is a superb thriller, a brutal depiction of criminality and power, and an unflinching portrait of the dark heart of American racism. It is a mesmerizing and wrenching work that only Dennis Lehane could write. So that sounds great to me. It sounds like the serious version of the previous book. Um, and so I'm down for both. I am absolutely willing to follow this crime um, in the sort of sweltering summer in Boston when they're trying to desegregate um, and find out what happened to these two people and what uh, Mary Pat Fennessy decides to do about it. So that sounds really exciting to me. I like Dennis Lehane um, and I'm uh, ready to try another one of his books. All right, the third one on my list. I'm pretty excited about this one. So this one is called In the Lives of Puppets and it's by TJ Klune. Um, So you know that I talked on the channel about the house in the Cerulean Sea um, and I am in the midst of his other book whose name has just flown right out of my head. But if I come up with it, I will uh, remind you. I'm in the midst of another TJ Klune book and then this one comes up uh, to be published April 25th. So I am excited about that. Um, it says, New York Times bestselling author of The House in the Cerulean Sea, In the Lives of Puppets, A Real Boy and His Wooden Heart, No Strings Attached. So there's definitely a Pinocchio reference there. Um, as you've heard me talk about before, T.J. Klune is an openly out queer author and likes to write um, queer characters and queer fiction, um, talks about it in a lot of his author's notes. So I'm excited to see um, how this book might go down. As I said, April 25th is the publishing date. It's tour books and it's 432 pages. Here's what we know about it. In a strange little home built in the branches of a grove of trees live three robots, fatherly inventor android Giovanni Lawson, a pleasantly sadistic nurse machine and a small vacuum desperate for love and attention. Victor Lawson, a human lives there too. They're a family, hidden and safe. The day Vic salvages and repairs an unfamiliar android labeled Hap, he learns of a shared dark past between Hap and Geo, a past spent hunting humans. When Hap unwittingly alerts robots from Geo's former life to their whereabouts, the family is no longer hidden and safe. Geo is captured and taken back to his old laboratory in the city of electric dreams. So together, the rest of Vic's assembled family must journey across an unforgiving and otherworldly country to rescue Geo from decommission, or worse, reprogramming. Along the way to save Geo, amid conflicted feelings of betrayal and affection for Hap, Vic must decide for himself. Can he accept love with strings attached? Author T.J. Klune invites you deep into the heart of a peculiar forest and on the extraordinary journey of a family assembled from spare parts. So I love TJ Klune. I love what he does with characters. I love um, how he gives me all the feels. So um, I'm looking forward to this. Even though the family is um, not human or not mostly not human, um, I still suspect there are gonna be a lot of TJ Klune feels in this one. So looking forward to that. So that was the third book. The fourth book on my list is Fifth Avenue Glamour Girl by Renee Rosen. So a lot of really good choices uh, for the week of April the 25th, but very different from one another. So Fifth Avenue Glamour Girl by Renee Rosen. The blurb says, a fascinating glimpse into a legend who has changed the face of cosmetics forever. And this is by Renee Rosen, USA Today bestselling author of The Social Graces. So this is published by Berkeley Books and it's 432 pages. It's 1938 and a young woman selling face cream out of a New York City beauty parlor is determined to prove she can have it all. Her name is Estee Lauder and she's about to take the world by storm in this dazzling new novel from the USA Today bestselling author of The Social Graces and Park Avenue Summer. In New York City, you can disappear into the crowd. At least that's what Gloria Downing desperately hopes as she tries to reinvent herself after a devastating family scandal. She's ready for a total life makeover and a friend she can lean on. And into her path walks a young, idealistic woman named Este. Their chance encounter will change Gloria's life forever. Este dreams of success and becoming a household name like Elizabeth Arden, Helena Rubinstein, and Revlon. 
Before Gloria knows it, she's swept up in her new friend's mission. And while Este rolls up her sleeves, Gloria begins to discover her own talents. After landing a job at Saks Fifth Avenue, New York's finest luxury department store, Gloria finds her voice, which proves instrumental in opening doors for Este's insatiable ambitions. But in a world unaccustomed to women with power, they'll each have to pay the price that comes with daring to live life on their own terms and refusing to back down. So a powerful woman story um, set in history. I don't know how much of it is true, how much of it is not true, but really curious about the life of Estee Lauder and you know whether or not she had this friend that partnered with her um, in her ambitions. It also reminds me a little bit of the uh, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I don't know why, the department store, the setting, the glamour, um, and the strong women coming into their own. So excited for that one, really looking forward uh, to getting my hands on that one. The fifth one on my list is The Eden Test by Adam Sternberg. So it is blurbed to say, a galloping and exhilarating thriller. The Eden Test is about marriage and deception and it will have you pulling against all odds for the couple at its center. And that is uh, a quote from Laura Dave. So I'm excited about that. Let's see uh, what the synopsis has to say. Let's also look at the publisher. So it's published by Flatiron Books and it's 336 pages coming out April 25th. Here is the synopsis. From Edgar Award finalist Adam Sternberg, an electrifying domestic suspense novel for fans of The Perfect Marriage and Rock, Paper, Scissors, about a couple who are forced to the ultimate extremes to save their marriage and themselves. Seven days, seven questions, forever changed. Daisy and Craig's marriage is in serious trouble. That's why Daisy has signed up for the Eden Test, a week-long getaway for couples in need of a fresh start. Yet even as she's struggling to salvage her marriage, it seems Craig has plans to leave her for another woman. In fact, his bags are already packed. Long before he arrives to meet Daisy in this remote cabin in the woods of upstate New York. At first, their week away is marked by solitude, connection, and natural beauty, and only a few hostile locals. But what Craig doesn't know is that Daisy, a slyly talented actress, has her own secrets including a burner phone she's been using for mysterious texts. Not to mention the Eden test itself, which poses a searing new question to the couple every day, each more explosive than the last. Their marriage was never perfect, but now the lies and revelations are piling up as the week becomes much more than they bargained for. How far are they willing to go? Adam Sternberg brings his wit, originality, and a Hitchcockian sense of dread to this chilling, surprising, and wholly entertaining portrait of a marriage on the brink. Ooh, that sounds creepy and good and exciting. Um, you know, marriage is hard. And so, you know, I'm interested in a book about a couple that is struggling, um, but going on a seven day retreat where they're going to ask you searing questions that make things more and more difficult, um, just, I don't know. I don't know if that sounds like a good idea to me, but I go back to the blurb where Laura Dave's, where Laura Dave says it will have you pulling against all odds for the couple at its center. So I hope that's true. I really like the uh, photo on the cover with her bra strap showing and them sort of in an embrace. The bra strap showing just sort of says to me, this isn't quite perfect, you know, and we've, we've heard it described that their marriage isn't quite perfect. They're in this embrace, but she's a little disheveled. So I don't know, that's what I take away from it. We'll see how it turns out. The next one, number six, is called We Love to Entertain by Sarah Strohmeyer. And it says the home of their dreams could prove to be their worst nightmare. Ooh. So this one is from Harper Paperbacks and it's 368 pages. Here's what the synopsis says. From the best-selling author of Do I Know You comes a fast-paced, riveting psychological thriller that skewers our modern obsession with home renovation and fixer-uppers. Holly and Robert Barron are attractive young real estate investors and contestants in a competition run by To The Manor Build, the nation's most popular home renovation app. 
With millions in product endorsements and online followers at stake, they're rehabbing a Vermont home they scored at a bargain price into a chic hilltop estate ideal for entertaining. It's all camera-ready laughs and debates over herringbone tile until Holly and Robert go missing hours after their picture-perfect wedding, leaving behind a bloody trail. Suspicion falls quickly on Erica Turnbull, the Baron's 20-something assistant, eager, efficient, and secretly in love with Robert. Did Erica let her misguided passion turn her into a murderer? So claim the townsfolk of Snowden, Vermont, who still haven't forgiven her for a tragic accident back in high school. But Erica's mother, Kim, is not about to let small-town gossip and a cop with an axe to grind destroy her daughter again. With time running out and their own lives at risk, the mother-daughter duo set out to find what really happened to the Barons. First, though, they'll have to confront the vengeful former owner of Holly and Robert's estate, ruthless reality show producers, and a secret that might bring their own house down. So this one is a psychological thriller, um, and I haven't read a really good psychological thriller in a long time. So I am down for this, and I hope that, um, you know, my mom and dad watch all of these home renovation shows. We don't watch a ton of television in my house, um, as you can imagine, if I'm doing all this reading. But um, I think I've seen every home renovation show there is um, at my mom and dad's house. And um, the fact that this is sort of centered around one of those home renovation shows is really fun to me. Um, but then that there's a mother-daughter duo that are trying to resolve this mystery. I like that too. So I'm hoping that this one really provides the bang for the buck that I'm hoping for. So that is We Love to Entertain by Sarah Strohmeyer. The next one, number seven on my list, is called Happy Place by Emily Henry. And she is the number one New York Times bestselling author of Book Lovers, which you probably remember. Um, all of her covers look very similar. They have a very Emily Henry feel to them. Um, and uh, I really like this one with the people um, in the floats and jumping. And, and they, they don't have perfect bodies, which I kind of love. So um, that is Happy Place by Emily Henry. It is published by Berkeley and it is 400 pages. Here we go, happy place. A couple who broke up months ago make a pact to pretend to still be together for their annual week-long vacation with their best friends in this glittering and wise new novel from the number one New York Times best-selling author, Emily Henry. Harriet and Wynne have been the perfect couple since they met in college. They go together like salt and pepper, honey and tea, lobster and rolls. Except now, for reasons they're still not discussing, they don't. They broke up six months ago and still haven't told their best friends, which is how they find themselves sharing the largest bedroom at the main cottage that has been their friend group's yearly getaway for the last decade. Their annual respite from the world, where for one vibrant blue week they leave behind their daily lives, have copious amounts of cheese, wine, and seafood, and soak up the salty coastal air with the people who understand them the most. Only this year, Harriet and Wynne are lying through their teeth while trying not to notice how desperately they still want each other. Because the cottage is for sale and this is the last week they'll have together in this place. They can't stand to break their friends' hearts and so they'll play their parts. Harriet will be the driven surgical resident who never starts a fight and Wynne will be the laid back charmer who never lets the crack show. It's a flawless plan if you look at it from a great distance and through a pair of sunscreen smeared sunglasses. After years of being in love, how hard can it be to fake it for one week in front of those who know you best? I really like this premise. So, um, you know, they're going to try to pretend to be together for a week in front of their closest friends while sleeping in the same bed, you know, in a blissful location where they've been before and won't ever have the opportunity to be again. So I'm really interested to see what unfolds and how Emily Henry tells this story. I think it should be a fun one. The next one is number eight on my list, and that is Ghost Girl Banana, which is a funny title, Ghost Girl, comma, Banana. And it is by Wiz Wharton. Um, and Harper's Bazaar from the UK calls it a rich and rewarding debut novel. Uh, this one is published by Harper Via, and it's 400 pages. Here's what we know about Ghost Girl Banana. 
Set between the last years of the Chinese wind rush in 1966 and Hong Kong's handover to China in 1997, a mysterious inheritance sees a young woman from London uncovering buried secrets in her late mother's homeland in this captivating wry debut about family, identity, and the price of belonging. Hong Kong 1966, Su Qin is exiled from Kowloon to London with orders to restore honor to her family. But as she trains to become a nurse in cold and wet England, Su Qin realizes that, like so many transplants, she must carve out a destiny of her own to survive. 30 years later in London, having lost her mother as a small child, biracial misfit Lily can only remember what Maya, her preternaturally perfect older sister, has told her about Su Qin. Unexpectedly named in the will of a powerful Chinese stranger, Lily embarks on a secret pilgrimage across the world to discover the lost side of her identity and claim the reward. But just as change is coming to Hong Kong, so Lily learns Maya's secrecy about their past has deep roots and that good fortune comes at a price. Heartfelt, wry, and achingly real, Ghost Girl Banana marks the stunning debut of a writer to watch. So in a debut, which I love, you know, you've heard me say a million times, I love giving a new writer a chance. Um, and usually when they're promoted this heavily um, by a publisher, they're, they're pretty impressive. So um, I hope that this one is. Um, also, there's secrets here. Um, and I love a good book with secrets. I love a family saga. Um, and I, I think that's what we're in for here. Plus, uh, it goes back and forth between Hong Kong and London. And I love to learn about different foreign countries and to experience stories set in them. So um, I have high hopes for this one. Number nine on my list is called Honey Baby Mine. And it is by Laura Dern and Diane Ladd, two names that you probably recognize. Uh, and the subtitle is A Mother and Daughter Talk Life, Death, Love, and Banana Pudding. And the foreword on this book is by Reese Witherspoon. So I think that's interesting. Uh, this one is by Grand Central Publishing and it is 256 pages. Here's the synopsis. A collection of deeply personal conversations from award-winning actress and activist, Laura Dern, and the woman she admires most, her mother, legendary actress, Diane Ladd. What happens when we're brave enough to speak our truths to the ones we love the most? Laura Dern and Diane Ladd always had a close relationship, but the stakes were raised when Diane developed a sudden life-threatening illness. Diane's doctor prescribed long walks to build back her lung capacity. The exertion was challenging and Laura soon learned the best way to distract her mom was to get her talking and telling stories. Their conversations along the way began to break down the traditional barriers between mothers and daughters. They discussed the most personal topics, love, sex, marriage, divorce, art, ambition, and legacy. In Honey Baby Mine, Laura and Diane share these conversations, as well as reflections and anecdotes, taking readers on an intimate tour of their lives. Complementing these candid exchanges, they have included photos, family recipes, and other mementos. The result is a celebration of the power of leaving nothing unsaid that will make you want to call the people you love the most and start talking. This sounds like an excellent choice for a Mother's Day gift. I hope my mom is not listening to this one because it might be a great choice for her. Um, I know Laura Dern. I don't know a lot about Diane Ladd, but I suspect my mom does. Um, and this just sounds great. You know, them, them sharing stories with one another on all the personal topics and giving you that feeling that, you know, you need to talk to the people in your life and your family and tell them how you feel um, while you have the chance. So I love that message and I will be very interested to hear what these two have shared with one another. What do we have next? Number 10, The Other Side of Infinity by Joan F. Smith. And we have these two folks that are sort of lying in a pool, I guess. One has a butterfly in his hand and there are marbles floating. I don't know what the mesh thing is there or if that's just supposed to be the bottom of the pool, but I suppose we will find out. Uh, this book is published by Fywell Friends and it is 336 pages. Here we go. 
They Both Die at the End meets the butterfly effect in this YA novel by Joan F. Smith, where a teen uses her gift of foreknowledge to help a lifeguard save a drowning man, only to discover that her actions have suddenly put her life at risk. It was supposed to be an ordinary day at the pool, but when lifeguard Nick hesitates during a save, 17-year-old December uses her gift of foreknowledge to rescue the drowning man instead. The action comes at a cost. Not only will Nick and December fall in love, but also she envisions that his own life is now at risk. The other problem? They're basically strangers. December embarks on a mission to save Nick's life and to experience what it feels like to fall in love, something she'd formerly known she'd never do. Nick, battling the shame of screwing up the rescue when he's heralded as a community hero, resolves to make up for his inaction by doing December a major solid and searching for her mother, who went missing nine years ago. As they grow closer, December's gift starts playing tricks, and Nick's family gets closer to an ugly truth about him. They both must learn what it really means to be a hero before time runs out. So YA, um, so of course, you know, elevated in the feelings department and in the drama department. But, you know, as you've heard me say, sometimes I really love that. Um, she has the gift of foreknowledge. Hmm, I don't know if I would want that or not. Um, but they are falling in love after she sort of saves his bacon. And, um, but now she has visions about what's going to happen to him. So... Um, I think it'll be interesting. I think the, uh, the premise is solid, and I'm uh, curious to see what happens between these two. Number 11 by Victoria Ying. It's called Hungry Ghost. Val's trying to be the perfect daughter, but at what price? And this is a really cool illustration here on the cover. It's a young woman who looks very sad and melancholy, and she's holding beautiful flowers but you can see her ribs. Um, she's, you know, open at the chest here. So I don't know if it means we're supposed to see into her heart or what that means, but it's definitely an interesting illustration. Uh, this book is by First Second Publishers and it's 208 pages. This is a graphic novel. So at 208 pages, it'll be a quick read, I'm absolutely sure. Um, and if the picture on the cover is any indication, the illustrations are going to be stunning. So here's what I know about it. A beautiful and heart-wrenching young adult graphic novel takes a look at eating disorders, family dynamics, and ultimately a journey to self-love. Valerie Chu is quiet, studious, and above all, thin. No one, not even her best friend Jordan, knows that she has been binging and purging for years. But when tragedy strikes, Val finds herself taking a good hard look at her priorities her choices, and her own body. The path to happiness may lead her away from her hometown and her mother's toxic projections, but first she will have to find the strength to seek help. So there's our explanation for what the, uh, the cover illustration means. She's super thin and she has an eating disorder, so we can actually see her bones. I love how that's portrayed. Um, and I'm very interested in, you know, I, I have a penchant for mental health type of stories, and uh, I'll be really interested to see how this plays out both graphically um, and in the plot of the story. So uh, I hope you're looking forward to that one too. As I said, I haven't tried a lot of graphic novels, um, but I have explored a couple recently, both Mouse um, and the one about the fish about the boy who is gay and coming out to his mother but doesn't speak, uh, his Korean mother doesn't speak a lot of English and he doesn't speak any Korean, something about a fish. I can't remember, that's okay. <laughs> so you'll have to go back and check one of my previous videos. All right, so we're up to number 12. Number 12 is When We Had Summer by Jennifer Castle. And it says on the cover of the book, they knew what they'd lost, but never expected what they'd find. Uh, this one is 336 pages, and I don't have a publisher, but it is out April the 25th. When We Had Summer by Jennifer Castle. The sisterhood of the traveling pants meets 13 little blue envelopes in this new young adult novel about a tight-knit, daring, and eclectic group of friends who dedicate every summer to completing their Hashtag summer sisters bucket list together. 
That is until one of their own passes away. Best friends, Carly, Daniela, Lainey, and Penny, aka the self-proclaimed hashtag Summer Sisters, have been coming to the New Jersey shore town of Ocean Park Heights ever since they could remember. And every year, the girls make a bucket list and dedicate their entire summer to completing every item on it, documenting their wacky escapades on Photo Slam for everyone to see. It's their tradition, and as long as the Summer Sisters had each other, the Rocky Jetty on the shore, and their bucket list, that would never change, right? But then tragedy strikes after Carly, the mastermind behind the bucket list, unexpectedly passes away. As the remaining Summer Sisters try to wrap their heads around their best friend's death, life seems determined to throw more curveballs at the girls, threatening to split the Summer Sisters up for good. Danielle is accepted to a prestigious music academy in New York City. Lainey finds out her family is moving to Florida and leaving Ocean Park Heights for good and Penny struggles to find her footing as she feels ready to leave childhood behind more quickly than either of her friends. What will hold them together with Carly gone and the Summer Sister seemingly over? Then Daniela finds Carly's final bucket list. And just like that, the Summer Sisters are back. But of course, things don't always go as planned, and the girls try their hardest to navigate grief, loss, and coming-of-age woes while keeping the Summer Sisters and Carly's memory alive. I just love the idea of having a bunch of friends that you have a mutual bucket list with, but, um, you know, the idea that one of them passes away and then they have to sort of figure out how to come together again for her left behind bucket list. Um, I can imagine that it's going to be kind of sad. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if there were tears for this one. So, um, I love a book that makes me cry. Um, if you can make me cry, you've won me over um, for your book. So um, I guess I'll hope that this one is as emotional as I think it's going to be. Uh, the next one is number 13 on my list, and it's called Don't Tell Anybody the Secrets I Told You, a memoir by Lucinda Williams. And it is by Crown Publishers, and it is 272 pages. Here's what we know. The iconic singer-songwriter and three-time Grammy winner opens up about her traumatic childhood in the Deep South, her years of being overlooked in the music industry, and the stories that inspired her enduring songs. Lucinda Williams' rise to fame was anything but easy. Raised in a working-class family in the Deep South, she moved from town to town each time her father, a poet, a textbook salesman, a professor, a lover of parties, got a new job, totaling 12 different places by the time she was 18. Her mother suffered from severe mental illness and was in and out of hospitals. And, was, and when Williams was about a year old, she had to have an emergency tracheotomy, an inauspicious start for her singing career. But she was also born a fighter and she would develop a voice that has captivated millions. And don't tell anybody the secrets I told you, Williams takes readers through the events that shaped her music from performing for family friends in her living room, to singing at local high schools and colleges in Mexico City, to recording her first album with Folkway Records and headlining a sold out show at Radio City Music Hall. She reveals the inspirations for her unforgettable lyrics, including the doomed love affairs with poets on motorcycles and the gothic Southern landscapes of the many different towns of her youth, including Macon, Lake Charles, Baton Rouge, and New Orleans. Williams spent years working at health food stores and record stores during the day so she could play her music at night and faced record companies who told her that her music was not finished, too country for rock and too rock for country. But her fighting spirit persevered, leading to a hard-won success that spans 17 Grammy nominations and a legacy as one of the greatest and most influential songwriters of our time. Raw, intimate, and honest, Don't Tell Anybody the Secrets I Told You is an evocative reflection on an extraordinary woman's life journey. So I love country music. I love pop music, rock music too, um, but I do love country music. And so I am really excited to read about Lucinda Williams' life. It sounds fascinating. It sounds like she had a really difficult time coming up. I had no idea that she'd had a tracheotomy as a one-year-old child. Um, but it sort of explains her sound maybe a little bit. Um, so really interested. It says, it's called Don't Tell Anybody the Secrets I Told You. 
So of course I'm curious about what the secrets are. Um, and you know, her mother's severe mental illness, her father sounds um, like a hearty partier. Um, and so we shall see. Um, really interested to hear her story and to, to read this book about Lucinda Williams. So number 14 on my list is Little Earthquakes by Sarah Mandel. This is also a memoir. I have a soft spot for memoir. If they are well written or about somebody whose story I really care about, I can really get into a memoir. So if you are a fan of memoir, check this one out. Check out the one um, about Laura Dern and Diane Ladd and Lucinda Williams book. So this one, uh, Little Earthquakes, is by Harper, published by Harper, and it's 288 pages. Here we go. Sarah Mandel has done something remarkable here. I found myself weeping, laughing with delight, and moved with love, all in the span of the day it took me to devour this book. Filled with deliciously specific images and metaphors, clear dialogue, and rich explorations of self and others, Mandel has written, among other things, a tender witness statement of and for her body. And that quote is from Hala Alian, author of Salt Houses. A psychologist, wife, and mother chronicles her extraordinary journey with cancer while pregnant with her second baby, and the insights into life, death, trauma, and healing that she gleaned. An utterly inspiring debut memoir reminiscent of the intimacy and emotional power of Paul Kalanithi's when breath, when breath Becomes Air and Kate Bowler's No Cure for Being Human. When clinical psychologist Sarah Mandel was pregnant with her second child, she began preparing for her maternity leave, juggling the demands of her soon-to-be baby with the needs of her patients. Noticing a lump in her breast, she assumed it was most likely a clogged milk duct, but a biopsy revealed it was not. When she went into labor, she learned that she had stage four cancer devastating news that forced her to confront terminal illness as she was bringing new life into the world. But Sarah's illness took a highly improbable turn when, after three months of treatment, her second PET scan showed no evidence of disease. Sarah, however, was unable to celebrate the good news. She was frozen in a disassociated state caused by the emotional whiplash of going from oncology patient to new mother, from a terminal sentence to a shocking reprieve. As a therapist who specialized in trauma work, Sarah had utilized narrative therapy to help her patient. Now she wondered, could the treatment that eased her patient's pain successfully help her navigate her own trauma? Little Earthquakes is a beautiful and thought-provoking debut from a brave and unwavering new voice that captures the mind, sears the soul, and leaves its indelible mark on the heart. Wow, what a story. So I cannot wait to read this and find out, you know, what it is like to be Sarah Mandel. And the fact that she uses this as a way to, to move through her own trauma, um, I think that's fascinating and amazing. So um, it sounds like a great story, the, exactly the kind of memoir that I will devour. Um, so I'm uh, happy to be able to share it with you and hope that you might be able to pick it up and be interested in it as well. The next one on my list is number 15, The Skin and Its Girl by Sarah Seifer. Uh, it is published by Ballantine Books and it is 336 pages. Here's the synopsis. A young queer Palestinian American woman pieces together her great aunt's secrets in this sweeping debut, a family saga confronting questions of sexual identity, exile and lineage. In a Pacific Northwest hospital, far from the Romani family's ancestral home in Palestine, the heart of a stillborn baby begins to beat and her skin turns a vibrant, permanent cobalt blue. On the same day, the Romani centuries old soap factory in Nablus is destroyed in an airstrike. The family matriarch and keeper of all the Romani lore, Aunt Nuha believes that the blue girl embodies their sacred history hearkening to a time when the Rumanis were among the wealthiest soap makers and their blue soap was a symbol of a legendary love. Decades later, Betty returns to her Aunt Nuha's gravestone, faced with a difficult decision. Should she stay in the only country she's ever known, or should she follow her heart for the woman she loves, perpetuating her family's cycle of exile? 
Betty finds her answer in partially translated notebooks that reveal her aunt's complex life and struggle with her own sexuality, which Nuha hid to help the family immigrate to the U.S. But as Betty soon discovers, her aunt hid much more than that. The Skin and Its Girl is a searing poetic tale about desire and identity and a provocative exploration of how we let stories divide, unite, and define us and even wield the power to restore a broken family. Sarah Seifer is that rare debut novelist who writes with the mastery and flair of a seasoned storyteller. So a debut, multi-generational, you've got secrets, you've got um, queer literature. We're gonna learn about um, Palestine and this family that is living there and has this baby that is blue. Um, and their soap factory is destroyed on the same day. Um, really fascinating um, and interesting to see how all of this comes together, how the story of the aunt uh, helps the niece make a decision about her life. So looking forward to that one. Number 16 on this long list of exciting books that are coming out on April the 25th is The Fitful Sleep of Immigrants by Orlando Ortega Medina. Uh, it is being published by Amble Press, and it is 335 pages. And here's what we know about it. Award-winning author and immigration attorney Orlando Ortega Medina returns to 1990s San Francisco in The Fitful Sleep of Immigrants, a powerful family drama that plays out within a captivating legal thriller. Attorney Mark Mendez, the estranged son of a prominent rabbi and a burned-out lawyer with addiction issues, plots his exit from the big city to a more peaceful life in idyllic Napa Valley. But before he can realize his dream, the U.S. government summons his Salvadoran life partner, Isaac Perez, to immigration court, threatening him with deportation. As Mark battles to save Isaac, his world is further upended by a dark and alluring client who aims to tempt him away from his messy life. Torn between his commitment to Isaac and the pain-numbing escapism offered by his client, Mark is forced to choose between the lesser of two evils while confronting his twin demons of past addiction and guilt over the death of his first lover. So a very complicated character. I love a good complicated character. He sounds like he's got a lot going on. Um, he has addiction issues. He's um, overwhelmed, getting ready to move to Napa and then has this issue with his boyfriend and his client. Um, so I am ready for uh, Orlando Ortega Medina to explore this character and uh, for me to learn more about what's going to happen in his life. I hope this one interests you as well. I also love uh, the cover, the two men here in an embrace. Um, for whatever reason, the one in the back looks like Roy Kemp to me <laughs> from Ted Lasso. <laughs> So, but I do think that the image is beautiful um, and just painted really beautifully. So, all right. Did I say Roy Kemp? It's Roy Kent. Okay. Uh, the last one on my list for April 25th, number 17, I hope you have stuck with me, is Rosewater by Liv Little. And the blurb says, Wonderfully Fresh, Zesty, and Sexy by Bernadine Evaristo. Um, we've got this woman with the pierced ears. They're double pierced, and her hair is cropped very short. Um, and it says it is a novel. So uh, it is published by Get Lifted Books, which I have never heard of. In all the books that I've talked to you about, I have never heard of Get Lifted Books. And it's 256 pages. Here is the synopsis. For fans of Queenie and Such a Fun Age, I'm a fan of both of those, comes a deliciously gritty and strikingly bold debut novel about discovering love where it has always been. Elsie is a sexy, funny, and fiercely independent woman in South London, but at just 28, she is also tired. Though she spends her days writing tender poetry in her journal, her nights are spent working long hours for minimum wage at a neighborhood dive bar. Not even sleeping with her alluring co-worker B can quell her existential dread. The difficulty of being estranged from her family, struggle of being continually rejected from jobs, and fear of never making money doing what she loves is too great. 
but Elsie is determined to keep the faith for a little longer at least. Things will surely turn around. They have to. But when Elsie is suddenly evicted from her social housing, her fragile foundations threaten to collapse entirely. With nowhere left to go, Elsie turns to her childhood friend, Juliet, for help. Among Juliet's mismatched cushions and shelves lined with trinkets, Elsie is able to breathe for the first time in years. But between the reruns of Drag Race and nights smoking on the balcony, something else soon begins to glimmer in Elsie's heart. Sometimes what you've been searching for has been there all along. Can Elsie see it in time? Featuring the incredible poetry of Kai Isaiah Jamal, Rosewater is a story of intergenerational love, healing, and one woman's journey home. A remarkable debut by an exciting new talent, readers are sure to be enchanted by Liv Little's distinctive and captivating contemporary voice. So it does sound like a very contemporary novel. As I said, I loved Queenie and Such a Fun Age. Um, so very interested in this book. Um, just watching this young woman at 28 um, try to overcome these hurdles and then potentially fall in love with someone who has been in her life all along and is there to help her. Um, I'm, I'm curious to see that love story unfold. So that is my list for April 25th. I feel like it is outstanding. Like the list is just full of good catches that um, you just really can't go wrong if you picked anything from this list um, to try and read. So I'm excited to have brought it to you. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you did, please click like and subscribe. It helps me to know what I'm doing that you enjoy so that I can do more of it. Um, I do have a wish list at the bottom of the description for each one of my videos. If you're interested in gifting me with a book, um, you can go there and they will send the book to me. I will read it, review it on the channel, and give you a big shout out. I would love that. So um, I hope you will continue to come back and watch my bookish videos. So I have a few more individual book reviews, uh, some bookstore tours, and a few little surprises up my sleeve. So I hope you'll continue to join me and we can talk all things bookish. Uh, I will see you soon. Take care. Bye.